Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the new Asus ZenBook 14. This is powered by a new Intel Ultra processor and it has an OLED display on board as well. And it's not all that expensive depending on how you configure it. And we're going to be taking a closer look at this one in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from Asus and we're done with it. It goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new laptop is all about. Now the price point on this starts at $799. This one has an Intel Core Ultra 5 125H processor, 8 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM running at 6400 megahertz, and 512 gigabytes of solid state storage along with the OLED display here. However, I'm going to recommend you spend a little bit more and get the model that has 16 gigabytes of RAM. And the reason is, is that these new Intel processors are incredibly powerful, so much so than the prior version that you're going to want to do more with this laptop. And the RAM here is going to limit you a bit, not only in its capacity at only 8 gigabytes, but also because the RAM on this model is a little bit slower than the 16 gigabyte variant that is running at 7,467 megahertz. So you'll get faster RAM and more of it, which I think is important to pair up with these new Intel chips. And also that mid-range model has a core uh, Ultra 7 versus the 5. So you'll get a little bit more horsepower and you'll get more memory and you'll be able to do more with it. And so I would recommend you look at that one versus this one, but for uh, the price point here, I think you're getting a lot of laptop. You're just not getting the most out of the uh, technology here that I think you can. Now, no matter which one of these ZenBooks you choose, you get a very nice OLED display on board, which is unusual, especially for a laptop that starts at this price point. And this is a 14 inch display. It is though running at a lower resolution than I typically see OLEDs running at on laptops. It's at 1920 by 1200. It is a touch screen here, as you can see and it will go flat to the surface of your desk, but this is not a two-in-one, so you can't flip it around. You get a very deep contrast ratio here with this OLED display like you do on any other OLED, so very deep blacks. It covers 100% of the DCI-P3 color space, so the colors are going to be very accurate on it for video editing and photo editing and graphic design and whatnot, so it's good for creative pursuits. The brightness on this goes to about 380 nits or so, and it has a peak brightness in HDR mode of 500 nits. Everything looks great on this. I'm very pleased with the image quality. The display runs at 60 hertz. Now, there are laptops out there that are going to 90 and 120 with LED displays, but for an OLED, I'm not complaining here. It's adequate for doing productivity work and light gaming. Now, one of the things that OLEDs are susceptible to is burn-in but they do have a few things built in to their software suite to help prevent the display from burning in. Now, one thing that uh, they suggest you do is leave windows in dark mode. You will get it in dark mode like you see here uh, by default. You can, of course, switch it out of that, but when you've got an OLED, if you have something white on the screen, those pixels are activated and lit up. So the more dark you can have on your screen, the better it is for power consumption, but also for the longevity of the display. Additionally, when you go through the device settings here, you'll see a few more OLED uh, features here. One of them is called pixel shifting. You can't turn it off. And what it will do is move the pixels around when something is on screen for a long period of time. You'll probably see this activating down here in the taskbar. Now, I have not noticed it doing this yet, but it's possible you might see a little weirdness going on occasionally with static images on your screen. So I would expect to see it around this Asus thing here and again down by the taskbar. What it's going to do is just move things around occasionally to keep those pixels from burning in. Additionally, they've got a special screensaver that'll kick on when the laptop is idle for 30 minutes or longer. And what it will do there is refresh all the pixels on the display, similar to the maintenance mode that my OLED TV upstairs does on occasion. So a uh, bunch of stuff in here to try to prevent burn-in, which is a common issue on these OLEDs. You don't see it right away, but over time you might. So they're trying to cut down 
on the potential for that. There's a few other things involved with it as well, but it's good to see them thinking about that because that is an issue that uh, people often uh, are concerned about when shopping for a laptop with an OLED. Now the weight on this comes in at 2.82 pounds or 1.28 kilograms. It's pretty lightweight. It is made out of aluminum, so it's got a good rigid feel to it. It doesn't feel cheap. And one thing I really like about it is that you can lift up the display with one hand. The keyboard doesn't come with it. It is very well balanced, which is nice to see. The webcam on this is also very nice. It's got a shutter up here, as you can see, and that shutter will cover up the camera along with its infrared sensor for privacy when you need it. And the image quality out of the webcam is good. It's a 1080p 30 frames per second camera. I was using it here against a backlit window. I wasn't blown out at all, as you can see. And because this has the new Intel processor, you can do a lot of the AI real-time effects like the blur you saw there a minute ago. So all in, very good for conferencing. Another thing I really liked about it was the quality of its speakers. One of the better sounding laptops I've reviewed in quite some time. Music sounds great. Uh, spoken word sounds great. Your conference calls will sound great out of here too. Very nice, rich, deep sound. It was actually very surprising to hear the sound sound this good out of this machine. So I was very, very pleased with that. The keyboard here is also quite functional. It is backlit. You've got nicely spaced keys. They're nice and large here. There's plenty of room on the keyboard deck. Uh, the trackpad is also very nice. It's not one of those fancy haptic ones. You've got a real button to push and you can actually push it all the way up here to the upper third of it. So uh, no issues here with the input at all a very comfortable laptop to use. The hinge is pretty sturdy on it as well. So all in a very nicely equipped laptop here, I think. Now, as far as ports are concerned, you get a couple of them. Uh, you do have a full-size USB-A port here on the left-hand side. This is running at Gen 1 speed, so about five gigabits per second there. On the other side, you have two Thunderbolt 4 ports so you can use external GPUs and other Thunderbolt devices with it. Additionally, you have an HDMI port here, uh, which is a full-size HDMI port, and you can get uh, your 4K output on it, no issue there. And then, of course, you've got a headphone microphone jack as well. So altogether, a nicely equipped little machine here that I think has a lot of utility. Let's take a look now and see how it performs. Now, before we jump into the performance, I did want to mention that it doesn't have a fingerprint reader on board, but it can support facial recognition through the camera system here. But if you have the shutter over the lens, you will have to undo it so the computer can see you. Let's take a look at its web browsing capabilities here real quick. We'll visit the nasa.gov homepage. I am using my Wi-Fi 6 network here at the house to do that. And as you can see, everything spins up very, very quick on here. This does have a Wi-Fi 6E radio on board, so you'll get the uh, best possible Wi-Fi performance when you connect it to your network, especially if you have one of those newer access points. But I think for doing basic work here, you're not gonna have any issue. Let's take a look and see how it can handle YouTube and streaming video now. So here we are with a 1080p 60 frames per second video playing back from my YouTube channel. And we did have one drop frame right when it first started up, but after that it was running just fine here and continues to do so. One thing you will notice when you have a 16 by 10 display is you will see some letterboxing when you watch 16 by nine content. That's normal, it's to be expected given that there are different aspect ratios here. And beyond that, everything's going to look great on this display. If your video service supports HDR video, it should work here as well. So you might see uh, brighter spots in some areas depending on how they formatted the video that you are watching. One thing to note though is that although this does support HDR, it does not appear to support Dolby Vision, uh, but otherwise I think for the price point you're going to have a very nice video watching experience on this device. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test we got a score of 335. That is a great score. It's actually about where last year's i7 processors were. And what this means in a real world application is that if you're doing a lot in your web browser or you're doing some stuff with Microsoft Office like Excel spreadsheets and Word documents, you're gonna do just fine with those things. And as far as battery life is concerned, if you're sticking to the basics, 
I think you're going to get anywhere from 8 to 10 hours out of the battery, if not a little bit more if you keep the display brightness down. So battery life is good on here for basic tasks and the performance seems to be pretty good as well. But now we're going to dial things up a bit. Let's take a look at video editing. All right, so here we have DaVinci Resolve running with a 4K 60 frames per second project. I'm going to drop a cross dissolve transition on here, a real simple edit, and let's see how it does. And actually it did better than I expected, even though it only has eight gigabytes of RAM. Now this is a pretty simple edit here. I think doing anything more uh, extensive like color correction and 3D effects or whatever is going to be more than this laptop can handle. But even with its limited memory, it is able to uh, do some real-time previews here uh, without any real stuttering that I can see. But you will have better performance out of the 16 gigabyte variant. Now let's move on to gaming. And this is where things get a little more difficult because of the RAM issue. So for example, you can run older games like The Witcher 3 here. This we uh, turned down to 1280 by 800 at the lowest settings. And as you can see, we were getting well above 60 frames per second. So you should be able to get decent 60 frames per second gameplay on here. But you will notice a few hiccups even with this lower end game here like you just saw there. And I think that's due to the fact that you don't have a lot of memory here to play with. Some other games we attempted to get working like Red Dead Redemption 2 and uh, Doom Eternal wouldn't even load because there was just not enough memory available even though the hardware here is capable of actually playing those games quite well. Now I did try to get No Man's Sky working here, but it also errored out. So unfortunately, even though this Intel chip is capable of playing most of the AAA titles out there these days, you're not gonna get them running on this eight gigabyte configuration. So if you want some casual gaming on your ZenBook here, go for the larger memory version. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 3,151. Even the Core Ultra 5 here performs exceptionally well over the prior generation Intel chips. Now, if you look just above it, you will see the HP Spectre X360 14 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. That had 16 gigabytes of RAM and the Ultra 7 Intel processor. There you can see it got a score of 3,857 and I would expect the ASUS version to be about where the HP is. And look how good that performance is versus something with an RTX 3050 on board. So these Intel chips have a lot of potential, but you need the memory to really get the most out of them. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a failing grade of 93.4%. That means that you will see about a seven or 8% drop off in performance when you place the system under heavy sustained load, like when you're playing a game or something like that. Video editing would not suffer as much here because that tends to be more bursty, but anything that really has the system working hard over an extended period of time will see a bit of a performance drop off. This does have a fan on board. It will suck in air here from the bottom, so you're going to want to keep the bottom clear. And the fan isn't too bad. You don't hear it too often actually. When you're doing the basic work that we were demonstrating earlier, you don't hear it at all. It's only when you start doing things like video editing and gaming that that fan starts to kick on. It's not all that loud. You will hear it. It's not too high pitched, but it is uh, definitely audible when you have a heavy load going on. But in general use, you probably won't hear it at all. All right, one last thing to take a look at here, and that is its Linux support. I did not have very good luck here. What was interesting is that I could not boot the machine off of either of the Thunderbolt ports. I had to plug something into the USB port here on the side. I am running the latest version of Ubuntu, but it did not detect most of the hardware. That includes the video and the audio. The touchscreen actually works, but I cannot get it beyond 800 by 600. And again, no sound or even Wi-Fi on this one. So we may have to wait a little bit for Linux support on this, maybe a BIOS update or some driver updates on the Linux side. Uh, but on the Windows side, it runs quite well. And I do think you'll do much better with the 16 gigabyte variant. That's gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, Brian Parker, Budley, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Steve Green, and Amda Brown.
If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.